This is Robert Stark. I am uh, joined here with uh, Paul Bingham. We're going to be discussing uh, Italian futurism and uh, Winham uh, Lewis. Uh, this show is uh, basically a continuation of where we left off on our last show, which was about Alistair uh, Crowley. And we kind of briefly uh, touched upon uh, Winham Lewis. Uh, Paul, it's uh, great having you back on. It's great to be back on, Robert. And I'm also joined here with my co-host, Alex Von Goldstein. How's it going, guys? I'm excited to uh, talk about the topic tonight. So we talked about Aleister Crowley and uh, touched upon uh, Winham Lewis, and we touched upon briefly towards the end on Italian futurism. And what all these people kind of have in common is that they exist without the they exist outside of the whole sort of traditionalist reactionary. Uh, modern uh, liberal uh, dichotomy, and they provide sort of a, uh, in, in a sense, like an alternative way uh, forward. Neither left nor right, nor fo but forward. Yeah, exactly. And uh, that's the way uh, it's been presented before, and that's the way I, I like to say. Uh, I think of the uh, of the band, the uh, the Stranglers who were accused of being fascist in the 1970s, and uh, there's actually a, a video of, um, oh, I can't think of the bass player for the Stranglers. He says, I'm not left-wing or right-wing, I'm new-wing. And uh, the interesting thing about Wyndham Lewis, <clears throat> and to a lesser extent, Marinetti and the Futurists, is that they existed out, not only without outside the left-right paradigm, but they also envisioned the global world because they were willing to look beyond nationalism and see the big picture. And they looked at it in a very realistic way, uh, uncolored by ideology and very influenced by sociology, human sociology. In other words, they looked at it in a very real way that was not, uh, there were no rose-colored glasses and there were no uh, liberalism and there were no uh, all those gloomy uh, fog-colored glasses of traditionalism. They looked through it you know, with the naked eye, and saw what they had to see, you know what I mean? Was this a so, reaction against yeah. the liberalism of someone like John Stuart Mill? <laughs> well, uh, John Stuart Mill was uh, very influential in the field of positivism, which, uh, oh, I can't think of the French guy that uh, also wrote uh, quite a bit about it, but uh, positivism is a leading modernist faction, and that would have been on the left of the modernist movement overall, whereas William Lewis, Marinetti, uh, these other figures would have been, well, if we were going to call it left and right, they would be on, on the right side, because positivism is a whole cult uh, deal where uh, John Stuart Mill um, was one of the proponents of it in England, and it's basically the whole science fraud fraudulent science movement of today that, you know, everything is the scientific method. We want science to rule everything. Neil deGrasse Tyson, magic Negro, uh, science fetish that is in the world today. That's all from John Stuart Mill and positivism. Well, other, well, well, um, you know what's funny, though? Didn't Horkheimer and Adorno say that positivism leads to fascism, though? Well, it's a reaction the reaction to positivism, every every action produces a reaction, and that's what they meant. Um, you know, uh, Horkheimer and Adorno were, were misunderstood, and what they meant is that, yeah, if you, if you bring up this nascent liberalism, yeah, people are going to react against it, and what's going to come up is fascism. And that's what they were basically, uh, that's what they were basically saying. And, uh, of course, futurism in Italy, I would say, was the weakest version of futurism overall, and it eventually was absorbed into the fascist movement. Politically, that's true. I th what's interesting is politically, Italian futurism was totally marginalized. It was absorbed into uh, a Mussolini's fascism, and then that was later defeated, and fascism <laughs> associated with fascism is completely marginalized. You see the same thing with like uh, thinkers like uh, Ezra Pound and Winham Lewis, who even kind of uh, slightly flirted with fascism. But Italian futurism made a huge impact on aesthetics, 
and uh, especially like the you see it in films like Metropolis and uh, Art Deco style uh, architecture and a lot of the like a lot of the posters and illustrations from like the 1930s have that Italian futurist influence. So even though they were marginalized politically, they had a major impact on uh, culture and aesthetics. And culture and aesthetics, in a sense, uh, kind of they outlive uh, politics. I would also like to point out a uh, little known fact is that uh, Ayn Rand was quite influenced by Italian futurism as well. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, her books were heavily um, influenced by it, and uh, her there were the earliest film adaptions of some of her novels were Italian um, were made by Italian uh, filmmakers in the 1920s. Yeah, I mean you can definitely uh, see it. Like if you see like a picture of the cover of a of like the Fountain Head. Well, yes, and you know specifically, like I said. Ayn Rand, I, I often say, if you want to understand Ayn Rand, you have to understand both futurism and fascism, because she was far more influenced by fascism than she was any kind of libertarianism, and that's why uh, her objectionist or objectionist movement is uh, considered so fascist and cliquey, because it, it was far more fascist. It's a Jewish version of fascism. Um, basically. Uh, we've been talking about this kind of theme of aristocratic individualism and all these individuals like Galister Crowley and Winham Lewis. And they're individuals who have this very clear vision of how society should be. And they're in conflict with the kind of the world around them. But what's interesting is uh, these same individuals who share the same, who come from that background are in conflict with each other. Because I know Winham Lewis had a uh, conflict with uh, with Italian futurists, especially Marinetti, and, and uh, you were mentioning in our last show he would actually go to like uh, Marinetti and like openly troll him. They he, he and the uh, the Rebel Art Center was founded because they differed from Italian futurism on some main points, <laughs> and basically. Well, to begin Lewis with, this, this all this all happened. Uh, Lewis this said all happened. They put too much emphasis uh, on uh, technology. Well, that was a principal point, but Lewis's uh, version of futurism vorticism involves the vortex, which is uh, well, what is a vortex? It's uh, like a tornado. It's a swirling uh, funnel of energy, basically. And so Lewis is looking at many forms of energy besides technology. And he wants to capture and convey that. And he feels that technology is kind of too, uh, too common. It's too available to the masses. If we read uh, The Art of Being Ruled, his writings on technology are very prescient because today, basically, the only way humanity is advanced is technologically. In most well, other ways, humanity is falling behind. Didn't, didn't Heidegger say, like, wasn't the thing that Heidegger w was most against was, was global technological materialism, right? I, I think that's what a yeah, lot of people, uh, people that yeah, were... That's what, yeah. That's all his works basically lead to that thesis, you know. Yeah, certainly. And it seems that, you know, I, Lewis called himself a fascist modernist and i know he i think in the early 40s he had written a book on on hitler and then he wrote a piece after visiting nazi germany called like the jews are they even human which is sort of uh you know sympathetic to jews but um yeah he but, wrote the hitler cult as well yeah which is, yeah uh, so so uh what what i was what i was saying is it, there it seems like there was a, a intellectual movement in the uh in the earlier part of the first half of the twenty first twentieth century, that um, that sided with fascism in ways that that uh, re related to fascism in ways, but was mostly against a kind of global technological materialism. So, could you could you go into that idea of like what global technological materialism like is? Well, you have the whole the whole situation today. Well, uh, of course, Wyndham Lewis was the uh, progenitor of the ideas that Mark, uh, not Mark, uh, McLuhan, 
Marshall McLuhan uh, basically uh, wrote down all his ideas. He was William Lewis described his global village. His, uh, just basically copied directly from William Lewis. You know. Oh, they were they worked and, together. There's a perception that uh, vorticism is just kind of an artistic movement in the sense that, like, a cubism is, is a... The thing is, uh, vorticism is a whole intellectual uh, philosophy. And uh, I haven't read The Art of Being Ruled, but I am looking over... I know Kerry Bolden wrote a uh, essay on uh, when Amherst's ideas. And he made a lot of the same... Uh, points that, that uh, Crowley made about that uh, yeah. democracy is hostile to artistic uh, excellence. And one of the quotes is uh, that demo- sort of democracy as well as uh, capitalism kind of uh, degrades uh, artistic uh, expression. And in the book, The Art of Being Ruled, which it's very, it's actually... I, it's on Amazon if you want to buy it, but there's not that much information out there other than... It's the expensive. Article. Yeah, it's very expensive. And there's Wh- really- Windham Lewis felt that his books were being suppressed during his lifetime, and I think the suppression still continues. And basically what he advocates in the book is that the artist is uh, best qualified as being like the ruling class, and then you have this kind of whole concept of, like, the fourth estate throughout history. There's been these cycles. Uh, there's been, like, theocracies. There's been rules of, like, the warrior class uh, through the Middle Ages. Uh, there's sort of the rule of the merchant class, which some might describe capitalism as. Uh, communism is seen as sort of an attempt of the rule by the proletariat. But, uh, like, communism uh, failed because the proletariat didn't have the intellect uh, to rule. And I've also heard interpretations that uh, uh, fascism is a re, is sort of the warrior class a reclaim, reclaiming the rule that was removed from them. But very few, actually, there's never really been a kind of a society where you've had like the creative class and the people with like the grand aesthetic visions as being kind of the ruling class. Like there have been maybe times where they would have a, a say, they would play a role within the aristocracy, but you've not, what Winham Lewis is actually advocating is an actual a society ruled by a creative class. Well, not only that, he also anticipates a lot of things in the future, uh, such as transsexualism. Uh, and um, The Art of Being Rule is a very interesting book. It goes along with Crowley in a lot of ways. Like I said, it doesn't fit the idea ideological agendas of most rightist sources that like that would tend to like Lewis, so it's somewhat suppressed, and it's not a popular book, but it's well worth reading, I would recommend, because Lewis is very prescient, he's very, uh, he thinks outside of the box, and again, this is the whole idea of the vortex, the whole idea of catch, capturing live energy, everything is in flux, everything is moving, everything is changing, it may be cyclic, we don't know, we do know that, um, artistically speaking, the artist has to be a part of it, a part of what he creates. And that's what I, I sent you that quote by Marinetti earlier, uh, <clears throat> which is a very interesting quote, uh, Robert. Um, uh, and uh, he says, "Art." Well, I didn't send it to you, but art is viol- violence, cruelty, and uh, sadism. And that's what uh, Marinetti considers art to be. Um, necessary. It, um, it must involve, it, that is what art is because uh, energy produces these negative forces. And I think Lewis rejects some of that. He certainly rejected it after World War One when he experienced the hideous violence and savagery of the techno- te- uh, technology being employed in this barbaric fashion. Um, Are you yeah, familiar with the artist Franz Mark? I'm sorry? Are you familiar with the artist Franz Mark? Uh, no, I'm not. Well, he has this... He also he was also a British uh, soldier in World War I, like, like Lewis, and he has a painting called Fate of the Animals. And when you look at this painting, you know, it, they're really... 
there were not paintings like this before it. Like the same way, um, with, like Lewis is also a painter. It, it seems that the uh, sheer violence uh, of World War One, like with with the advanced technology that was for, that was introduced on the battlefield for the first time, that it had that it had dramatically affected painting. That painters who were in this war were but were were in this sort of visceral frantic zone and when they went back to painting there was a sort of new art that emerged do you see that absolutely that's 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 why in many ways the vorticist movement um with lewis uh at the helm outlasted the italian futurist art um which kind of died out after world war one or was rather assimilated by fascism but lewis kept it in a more pure form, I think, because he wanted to capture that uh, those, that imagery that only, you know, things that um, you, you both see and feel. You feel the fluidity as well of the, of the violence, the barbarism, the hideous nature of, uh, of the conflict. With Italian uh, futurism, a uh, big part of it is a technological technology, and that was a disagreement with Lewis. But also a big part of futurism is uh, testing uh, what works and what does not. And a big part of it was like experimentation. Like you were mentioning on our last show, like they would uh, t they would take like a, a chariot and like a drive it, uh, take a chariot behind a car and like drive it at a high speed, race away. Uh, motorcycles. Motor there's, oh, a, motorcycle. there's a... Picture. If anyone wants to look it up, you can probably find it on Google of a pic of chariots being being raced with motorcycles in, on Italian speedways, and it's quite um, it's quite interesting. But uh, yeah, basically the whole point of youth is to find out what works and reject what doesn't work. And uh, this is why the futurists believed um, that every generation must create its own cities, which you know, when was the last time you heard of a new city in this country? You know, the cities just keep growing, the suburbs, you have an endless deal. It's not really a city, it's just a collection of houses, gas stations, and suburbs. But you don't have any new cities, and the old cities just decay from the, in, from the inside out. And uh, the futurists felt that every generation must build its own cities, its own unique cities, finding new ways to create metropolises or... In their day, it was motor cities. We still have motor cities today. We haven't found anything better than the concept of the motor city. Uh, and uh, it's been 80 years, you know, it's been tried. It doesn't work that great as, in so far as it does not mesh with human biology that well. But we continue to beat our heads square. Well, well like the, uh, There was an Indian tribe in uh, Washington State that used to shape their... Uh, their children's heads um, to a point by uh, pressing them into a cradle. And this is the kind of thing that um, futurism rejects. It rejects those traditions that force people to do things the same way over and over again, even though it's against their nature, it's against biology, it's against uh, uh, future innovation. Yeah, and that principle applies to like urban planning. As you mentioned, uh, Italian futurists advocated each generation creating a new city. A lot of, uh, we kind of copy a lot of bad ideas uh, in urbanism, like building uh, more, uh, like, uh, track housing and, like, Walmarts, because part of it's uh, economic and uh, corporate interest, but a lot of it has to do with people just kind of continue with what they're familiar with, rather than strive to do, like, a new and innovative things. It's like Detroit or Chicago. Large portions of Detroit and Chicago are now fields overgrown fields. There's no cities there anymore. The, you know, the, city, the cities are shifting constantly and they, they never, they never die out completely, but we have the same city and we have a blighted area. We have a ghetto, we have a, and then there's a prosperous side of town where some nice houses are, but it's all within the city limits. You know, the, the, the prosperity is always shifting around any given city, but they're never building anything new. They're not starting a new city. They're not saying, this city is a total joke. The grid is laid out poorly. Everything is poorly done. This, we no longer need a factory town. Let's start over and do something new. Let's build a garden city. Let's do something else. But that's never said, you know. 
but it happens anyway just through uh, the time passing or situations like Chicago and Detroit where or East oh, St. So Louis and yeah, you told me you were gonna you were working on this piece called the Motor City and the Zombie Apocalypse, which is about that thing. Yeah, I worked on it for a long time, and then I realized no one wanted to publish it because uh, most people are quite content. Um, but if you go to uh, areas on the Mississippi, like East St. Louis, on the Illinois line, you it, it, it looks like a war zone. It looks like the aftermath of a war zone. And it's static. And if you go into, into a large area uh, around St. Louis, or if you just get on a train, if you ride the Amtrak, you will see such devastation in most major cities. And everyone knows this, uh, that, uh, you know, you've got a lot of old buildings, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, buildings that would, are not properly coded and are not up to code. And uh, the codes themselves are a joke. And so... There's well, a lot of issues that um, are not addressed because urban planning in the United States today is a joke. It's just how many people can you cram into this area, and it's all based on uh, banking rather than uh, other practicalities. Yeah, I mean, it's but, uh, it seems like there is this but, this general this general decline that's happening across the board. A, a friend of mine remarked that it seems like the world has already ended. And I, and I think that that's true. But just to go back for a second, I think it relates to what we're talking about completely. Could you give us a definition of global technological materialism and how it has affected this decline? I think the fact that everybody has a cell phone has caused people not to be brighter. Um, it's caused a, a decay of everyone's minds because just because somebody in Africa can talk to somebody in the United States via cell phone, it's, it's, a uh, it doesn't help anything. Texting doesn't help anything. Um, none of this helps, you know, none of this improves the quality of life or no, none of this improves, makes people any smarter or any, um, any, any more better off. And that's what I would, I would point to the cell phone as the, the, uh, epitome of global technological materialism. Well, you don't... Yeah, I mean, I kind of made that point on the show, the San Francisco trip show I did, where if you visit a place like the Silicon Valley, which is a center of, like, supposedly all this uh, technological innovation, when you drive around there, you see nothing but, like, uh, uh, like just, like, your generic uh, suburbia and suburban office well, parks. Like, you would expect, like, some uh, really... Uh, futuristic uh, city, but the thing is, uh, problem is uh, some. I mean, I'm not a Luddite. I don't reject a technological progress, but uh, technology uh, without the culture and the right uh, thinking behind it can become, if it's in the hands of just without the right backing. Well, well, here's the thing. Uses. I mean, my my sort of counterpoint to this, I I, I feel in a way that I have over time become a, a technological progressive in that, you know, when someone complains about a piece of new technology, I sort of think that they're just in the stage of uh, adapting to it. Like, Robert, I agree with you in that we have this technology and it's being used for the wrong purpose or, or that it's controlled by the wrong people. Uh, but I do think that this technology can be used in a way that can benefit human beings. I, I just think that uh, um, what, what, what's happened is, uh, you know, global technological materialism has been operating in a, in a top-down top way. You know, our revolutions, our cultural revolutions, like the revolution of the 1960s was a top-down revolution. The bourgeois was telling the proles, the, proletari the bourgeois was telling the proletariat how to act. But I do think the 21st century will be a bottom-up revolution where, where the proles will take charge, and I think they will be able to use technology to do this. I mean, like, I haven't met either of you guys in person, but we're able to use technology to have these discussions. I would, uh, I would agree somewhat. I don't, I'm, I'm reserving my opinion overall on whether you're correct or not, but for example, in, in the Ron Paul campaigns, we use technology effectively against uh, the Republican Party 
to achieve our ends and against the, the, the most powerful people in the Republican Party to win um, some localized victories, uh, which otherwise would not have been possible. And uh, that's, that's an example. Now, long term, we accomplished very little, but uh, and that's the thing. The peasant can have his musket for a while and top of the night, but in the end, the peasant doesn't win just because he has, he has musket temporarily topples the night. What do you think about those uh, renderings that the Italian futurists did in their illustrations for those uh, uh, grand, uh, grandiose uh, cities? Um, I don't fully, I cannot fully internalize the futurist art. In my opinion, it's the most, it's the most heavily, um, uh, considered, uh, part of futurism and perhaps the most overrated part of futurism, though, um, you probably have a different opinion because you're an artist yourself, Robert. And you can we see actually, things that I uh, can't. Robin and I did a whole show on Italian futurism, but it was a totally different show. We focused on more of the aesthetics of it, but we didn't really get into their ideas in depth that much. Well, I mean, there are so many. They they wanted to revolutionize the lifestyle of the Italian people. And I sent you another note um, regarding futuristic cooking. That's how oh. far Marinetti went. He wrote a book, a cookbook. Or a futurist cook, a cookbook. Paul, have you Paul, and, ha, have you ever read uh, Jean Baudrillard? Uh, I've read bits and pieces. Yeah. Well, what's funny is, I mean, he he's like a postmodernist. I don't know how you feel, or post-structuralist. I don't know how you feel about that kind of stuff. But he he. I like him. Well, he says that you know we're we're basically going to be overtaken by the simulation, which is global technological materialism. Like we're going to be overtaken by it, and. Uh, in Fatal Strategies, which is his 83 piece or book or whatever, he says that the Italians are the ones who adapted to the simulation the best because they didn't allow it to affect their culture. Like the Italians just sort of went with global technological materialism, like their evolution just sort of, they were able to be symbiotic with it. Do you see that? Was he right? I think to a certain extent they did the best job of any country in Europe and certainly better than the United States. Could you make the same, uh... And here's where I would say the perfect example of that is, is would be Sophia Loren. Yeah, why, why is that? <laughs> just... Uh, I just think the her movies encapsulate Italian culture within the, the realm of uh, global... Uh, technological materialism, as you put it. In other words, Italian culture is uh, is within is it's like in the eye of the storm. It's, well, it's all around it. What about someone yeah, like uh, but, you know Truffaut or, Gud or or Godard? Do you think like uh, sort of French filmmaking? Where where uh, you know of the same time? You know that Sophia Loren was the star. You had you know. Uh, blossoms of creativity all throughout Europe. Europe. How does Italian cinema? How how does Italian? How was Italian cinema more authentic than let's say you know French New Wave? Uh, because it was more connected to the Italian people. Uh, French New Wave was divorced. It was it was very bourgeois and internal, whereas. Italian is more rural, and uh, they use the word earthy a lot, but it's not the proper word. It's more peasant-based, is the way I would put it. It's more based on people and people who are all cousins, in a way, in a manner of speaking. It's based on the kin, on the uh, on the uh, the family structure, and the Italian family structure, which is very different than the French family structure, which died out in the 20th century. And... So France is more of a area of isolation, and that's the the artist's experience is one of isolation. Whereas the Italian uh, view is more one of community, and you can see this. There's a lot of, of course, there's tons of French films. You can easily see the difference, but uh, you see ones in uh, movies like uh, "Those Who Love Me Can Take the Train," and that's a you know it's a, like. Uh, archaic deal. They have to go 
by train rather than some rapid form of transportation in the 1990s. And they're transporting this dead artist. And the whole the whole image is, is that's, that's modern, that's French art, is sterile, it's impersonal, it's uh, remote, whereas Italian is still based on the village rather than the, the city. Yeah, I mean... The bourgeois. Uh, with the differences between uh, Winhattan Lewis and Italian uh, futurists like Marinetti, uh, do you see those uh, cultural conflicts between uh, Italian culture and uh, Anglo culture? Well, Wyndham Lewis considered himself to be an American or a Canadian, though he really was a he really was an Englishman to the core. Even though his father was a colonel in the Civil War, and uh, you know was an American uh, or a Canadian, perhaps I I just remember. But uh, Wyndham Lewis had a very aristocratic view. We talked about aristocratic individualism. It's kind of like um, his view is his view of the art of being ruled. His central point is it does either fascism or Bolshevism is better than democracy. That's the takeaway point, and it doesn't matter which because both are revolutionary disciplines that uh, completely reject liberalism and either the it's the, the rigorous ideologies. It's like Yukio Mishima said once about hanging out with the communists, he said, we should, one thing in common, a rigorous ideology and a taste for violence. Or That's two things in common. But that was his basic quote. And uh, Marinetti is, a ver- is just basically very focused, even before World War I, on I- Italy and the movements within Italy, whereas, of course, Windham Lewis, his experience is different because at that time, England controlled a large portion of the world. So he's thinking global. Uh, Marinetti is thinking local. And Windham Lewis is seeing the world as it is and basically interested in uh, capturing the movement without being sucked into... uh, you know, in national prejudices or, or you can't think outside the box if you put yourself, if you create a box to fit into. You can't look at the whole situation if you're a nationalist. Um, Lewis is always outside a movement. He may flirt with a movement, but he's never inside a movement. He never belongs to the, he may be friends with Mosley, but he's not a black shirt. And uh, whereas Marinetti dives enthusiastically into various other political movements. He doesn't take a detached aristocratic in, in interest in any of it. Are there aspects of uh, Lewis's work that would uh, strongly go against uh, traditionalism or the right? Well, Lewis's work changes over the years, but um, I think uh, I think Lewis would uh, present a critique of the right that's very similar to the critique uh, Crowley would present. Actually, it w- it w- he would uh, he would look outside it and critique the right from an illiberal perspective, and his critique is very interesting because you have to remember that uh, Lewis exists. He actually does this in the Art of Being Ruled. I believe it was the Art of Being Ruled. He takes another modernist, Anthony Ludovic- Ludovici, who is another interesting character and uh, a modernist, though not a futurist. And he critiques Ludovici from an illiberal pers- perspective, even though Ludovici is pro- probably the least uh, liberal, or um, he, he, he is, if anything, a, um, a very rightist figure. But Lewis critiques him from farther to the right than Lud- Ludovici is, and that's what makes the critique interesting, because... Um, he is not as involved, politically involved, as Ludovici is, and that enables him to cast a uh, more impartial and more uh, more uh, theoretical uh, eye upon Ludovici's works. Uh, more, you know, from the uh, non uh, non, uh, but at the same time, very much non-liberal um, consideration of Ludovici's work. And that's just one example of 
of how uh, Lewis differs um, from Marinetti. And like I said, um, he, he also differs from uh, Ludovici on the right because Ludovici is a very um, contemporary uh, right uh, individual. One might compare him to uh, Nicolas Gomez de Vila, the uh, Colombian reactionary. But Lewis is not a reactionary because he embraces things as they come, and he recognizes that uh, there is a, the world is always in flux. There is energy passing through constantly, and there are many things that we don't understand that uh, that are there to be learned, and uh, there is knowledge to be gained. And that's why his opinions change over the years. As toward the end of his life, he became uh, supportive of the, of the United Nations to prevent a future world war, which um, concerned him greatly seeing the devastation of yet a, a third world war, which he'd gone through too, and he did not want to see in his last years another world war emerge. Did you say he said something about a, a transsexuality in his book? Yeah, he talked, he has a chapter, I think, called uh, Man and Shaman, and he talk, he discusses the cultural impact of the third sex, those men who claim to be women, and he even talks about the anthropological findings of certain Indian tribes in which um, uh, certain individuals claimed, certain male individuals claimed to be female individuals there, Burdash or Two Spirits, some of them are called. Yeah, yeah. And I, they, no. they actually, turn, um, supposedly, um, certain, there are reports of some of them uh, living as women, growing their hair long, and there are even reports of them um, developing uh, female sexual organs. Well, not there even wait, some uh, Roman emperor who tried to give himself a sex change. Yeah, I, I just want to in, yeah. in, interject real quick here, where uh, I think an in, an interesting thing that a lot of modern people who call they you know they call themselves liberals, these people they they believe that the things they're fighting for. Uh, it's like a, a, like a new paradigm, you know, like we, human beings have evolved to this point where men can now transition into becoming uh, women. Like I remember uh, a friend, I, you know, I had some friend who just sort of drank the Kool-Aid and became a transgender and was basically... Well, but I've also heard liberals make the case that... Uh... That, that it, this stuff existed a long time ago, so sure, it's nothing sure. I know. Well, that's that's what I uh, that's what I wanted to say is that it's it, there's this weird thing where it's like it is an eternal cycle in one ways, and it's always presented as new in another way. Like I remember, I was reading uh, Wilmot Robertson's uh, Dispossessed Majority, and in it he talked. You know, that book was written in like 1972, and he's talking about how people uh, would get fired from their jobs for saying things that were racist in the 1930s. I know that I know, Albert J. Nock had written something that was, you know, sort of critical of Jews in the, uh, you know, 1940s, and he got, you know, he never wrote ag for the Atlantic, and he never wrote again after that. So it's like people believe that political correctness is like a new thing, but I, it really seems like the stuff has gone in cycles for forever. Well, that's the whole point of the... The concept that everything is in flux, that's the basic point of all futurism, that everything is in flux. We're not on a linear path to anything. We're, everything is constantly in motion. There's an energy in the air. Whether we're going round and round in a circle or we're going up and down, uh, back and forth, we're, you know, it's not clear, but one thing is clear, that everything is in flux. Everything is changing constantly. So things that change one way might also change the other way, in other words. So, There's this uh, uh, concept of uh, cybernetics, and uh, cybernetics, it's like a transhumanist concept of using uh, technology to rewire the brain. And uh, you can sort of make a lot of the same points about like uh, art and uh, poetry. Absolutely, and I've always said poetry is a form of coding in terms of like... Uh, computer or uh, computer coding and uh, poetry is a coding for development of the mind and uh, uh, basically shaping the mind or creating certain structures within the mind and uh, putting certain thoughts within the mind 
has an impetus to having other thoughts and ambitions. And uh, poetry is not just poetry, words on paper written for amusement. The poems are written in certain ways, grammar is used in certain ways, semantics are a real thing. I, you know, being able to craft a sentence that will influence individuals to action. The idea that writing is supposed to do something more than entertain is novel in this day and age, but that's what the futurists had in mind. The futurists were big, were pre-ADHD culture that believed that the, the written word was significant and the way it was, it should be deployed rather than uh, merely um, dispensed. With the futurism, uh, like all these uh, new movements that uh, come about, uh, there's like the transhumanist movement, and there's things like uh, cyberpunk, but uh, a lot of that stuff, it focuses on like uh, kind of a cool aesthetics, but there's nothing really uh, going on today uh, comparable well, what to a, like Italian futurism. What about neo-reaction? You know, it seems like neo-reaction is... Uh... Sort of. They don't do anything though. They they literally do not do nothing at all. Like they sit in front of a computer. Marinetti crashed a car. If the only way the way the only thing I see futurism being tested publicly, I'm, it is tested in many ways behind the scenes. But publicly, the only way I see futurism being tempt, tested is in the USC, and that's in the various types of steroids which out athletes deploy and employ against one another. And then we see guys who are offering their bodies to experiment with these new uh, these new concoctions to fight each other and see which one works the best. Oh, and UFC. And that's the only area. Go ahead. You're talking about the UFC. Yeah, the UFC. And again, it's like the, basically the, the modification of the body via steroids. Is where exactly. So, so and you you see no other no other kind of uh, real progress going no, on. No other pub, no other public so, uh, endeavors. That are, so, uh, what about the you know what about That's the about like uh, changing the body, and that kind of gets into the theme of like the transhum uh, transhumanism. Well, it's study? not just changing the body; it's deploying the body as well to do certain acts like. Um, you have John Jones who learned jiu-jitsu and a bunch of other martial arts within a few months uh, because of his athletic background and went on to become the unbeaten UFC champion, uh, light heavyweight champion, within a period of a few months because uh, of his of certain coaching techniques and use of steroids. Well, what's up with UFC and, like, mindfulness? <laughs> it seems like there's some, you know... Uh, Robert and I have talked about this idea of, like, the green pill, which is, uh, you know, I sort of see it as, like, you know, the people that were taking DMT and research chemicals a while ago and were into artists like Alex Gray and maybe would, you know, check out the Joe Rogan podcast or something. And it seems like there is some space within the contemporary culture that is, like, psychedelic drugs, UFC, meditation, being a vegan, but it doesn't really ever go into the real. But there are people that are on the periphery of the simulation that are almost out of it. I think the, the issue is the wrong kind of people are doing it, kind of like the hippies back in the day. Oh, yeah. They were doing that, uh, like, uh, Harlem uh, Venison made in our last show, like, he's into, like, that kind of stuff, like LSD, DMT. And, I mean, I've never tried it, so I can't really speak from experience. But his point is that it can create amazing intellectual uh, stimulation and uh, well transcend the uh, human intellect, but it has to be, like, the right people using sure. it. Sure. I mean, like we said on the show with Harlem Venison, uh, Ernst Jünger and Albert Hoffman, uh, they, they took acid together every five years, you know, and I really want, I would, you know, if I could go back in time and then visit, you know, interaction between people, I would love to go and take acid with Albert Hoffman and Ernst Jünger. But, you know, that both of these guys did this every five years and they both, you know, they both lived to over a hundred, so. 
Yeah, and I mean, Paul yeah, was making that point on the Crowley show. Uh, Alistair Crowley experimented with uh, different forms of a, a drug use and a sexual experimentation, but the purpose was that every act had a purpose as opposed to just a, like uh, hedonism. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of like anal sex for me, but not for thee, because the anal sex for me, I can use I can use for something other than pl- my momentary pleasure. Just an example, <laughs> and not anecdotal, I might add. I'm just throwing that out there. It's it's, uh, it's just a general concept of yes, Joe Rogan is going to take DMT and go sit in his isolation chamber, and what's he going to come out and do? He's going to do some stand up. It's like Joe. I don't. I like Joe Rogan's podcast. I live, listen to it. I think he's a very intelligent guy. But what is he producing from all those experiences? He's producing a little bit of stand up that's well, increasingly unfunny. Yeah, I mean, and uh, you know, I don't feel called to really do DMT. I want to have other experiences that I'm striving for. But I'm not. I'm personally not inter- interested in DMT. But a futurist would say I'm going to do DMT while I'm riding my motorcycle, and then I'm going to chronicle that. Or I want to do DMT uh, before going into a firefight or something like that. And like I said, the, the real futurists are pretty much underground, and they mostly work. In, they mostly live in Mexico, and uh, you know that's that's pretty much that. Uh, there are Mexican as, uh, futurists that are active today. I would say, yeah, uh, people who um, who are proponents of Italian futurism are mostly uh, whites in third world countries. Are they indigenous whites? Like they uh, they have been there for several generations, or are they white kids? Some that- indigenous. Some indigenous, some whites expatriated. Oh, okay. So it's like the white people that choose to live in uh, foreign locations that are, uh, as liberals say, quote unquote, developing. Those are the people that. Are yeah. Like, so, so what makes these people the true futurists? Because I view a lot of these people like you know dreadlocked nerds that I want to punch in the stomach. Because because they're in there doing stuff. They don't mind experimenting on human beings. They don't mind, you know, you know, it's like, you know, in the third world country, it's much much easier to enact the island of Dr. Moreau and stuff like that. <laughs> so they're doing that? Example. They're doing that out there? Get some kid from Oklahoma's I mean, moved to Zaire and he's experimenting there's all kinds on people? Of stuff. There's all kinds of stuff going on. I'm not saying I know of anything like that going on. I do know that the futurists are going where there's space to do you know, if I was going to get into experimental stuff, I would go overseas myself, or I would go to South America or Central America. This is what uh, John McCaffrey did. This is what John uh, McCaffrey did. Yeah, uh, yeah, He was down there developing drugs. Uh, there's tons of guys like him out there trying to stay below the radar so they don't end up like him. Sure, sure, yeah. Definitely. I see, I see that for sure. It's like you're basically going off the grid for real. Yeah, and McCaffrey kind of just got, you know, involved in politics and other things down there and basically got in trouble. But he went down there to do chemical research and uh, develop drugs. And that was his purpose. And that's what, you know, what he did is very common. And he was kind of like the ugly American who did it. But there's a lot of more sophisticated people out there doing it. I mean, McCaffrey is very low level. He actually tried to run for... Uh, president uh, in the Libertarian primary, which is kind of like, I don't know, um, I don't know, it's it's just not very dignified. It gets less dignified all the time, the Libertarian presidential primary. So it, it shows he's on a fairly low level, but he's, he is an example of... Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, 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 would, I, would, I would agree with you that John McAfee is on a lower level compared to someone who would like truly be on a high level but but uh you know compared to the the kind of people that are are presented by mainstream politics especially within the uh libertarian party like someone like john McAfee seems to me like a learned intellectual compared to someone like austin peterson 
Well, the Libertarian Party is very much of a joke, and I was involved, I've been involved in a long time. I worked both Ron Paul campaigns, and Libertarianism is just a form of LARPing for nerds, honestly. I've come to that conclusion. It's a form of LARPing? L- what? L- LARPing. Live LARPing. Action. Live yeah. Action yeah. Yeah. The thing about all these different movements, whether it's like a futurism, like this, like there's different uh, subsets of futurism, like cyberpunk, and a lot of the reactionary stuff about reliving the past. A lot of these movements are kind of a LARPing. Well, and, yeah. Uh, they're into cool like aesthetics and all that, but there's not. There's no. There's any no kind of a clear uh, vision or plan. Well, there's no substance. One of the uh, one of the interesting perspectives on futurism from uh, philosopher still living is uh, Paul Virilio, the Italian uh, philosopher, and uh, what, one of his earliest accounts in from back in the seventies, I guess, is having ridden in a car that was being driven in excess of two hundred miles per hour, and his thoughts as he was in this car. In other words, he's in this car that's going 200 miles per hour, and he's remembering what kind of thoughts he's having as this event occurs in real time. And that's an example of somebody engaging in futurism, in my in my opinion. Now, that's also an outdated one, from, like I said, from the 70s, but that would be my... You know, seeing what where your mind goes when you're driving 200 miles per hour. And this kind of goes back to kind of the concept of aristocratic individualism. Only a small uh, handful of people have that kind of a mental capacity to expand their... uh, Your average average person is just not going to uh, get those experiences. Yeah, precisely, Robert. And uh, nor do they want the experience. That's the other point is there are a lot of experiences nobody wants to experience. Uh, very few people want to stand on top of a mountain uh, that they spent three days climbing and look down. And I know individuals who climb mountains merely to get to the top to see what it looked like. And uh, very few people want to do that. Very few people want to experience danger. Very few people want to test the limits of speed. Very few people want to get involved in, in any of this. They want to engage in a facsimile of it, but they don't want to do the Well, do you, do you know, I mean, you know that guy Dan Bilzerian? Yeah, I listened to the podcast. Oh, Joe he, Rogan did well, yeah, I mean, week. he's like this big bearded guy. He's all muscly. Robert, do you know Dan Bilzerian? Yeah, I've heard of him. Well, you know, the thing about this guy is he's so fucking popular, you know? Like, you know, you go out and you meet normal people that really aren't interested in fringe politics or, you know, weird art and shit. So you go and you talk to them about, you know, things that other that people generally know about. And Dan Bilzerian is, like, worshipped by people. And, you know, the funny thing to me about Dan Bilzerian is he's meant to... Um, you know, he's meant to signify, like, masculinity, like, he's the big macho guy, but he hangs out with chicks all day, you know, he's, he's around, he's just around tons of women, you know, and to me that almost seems, like, not, not masculine, because it's like he's in a gossip circle of, unless they're all pleasing him or something, but, you know, I mean, it's like we had James O, we had James O.J. Miera on, and he was basically saying that this idea of the man going out and looking to hang out with chicks all the time it would, would have been seen as, like, you know, gay in the 30s when it was, you know, you're more about being amongst your group of, of men and sort of striving for something. Well, Dan Bilzerian is building a brand, and his brand is to be like the alpha of a, with a harem. So it's a bit different than... Uh, just a guy who likes to spend his leisure time with a girl, with a girl, with a bunch of girls. Um, it's a different aesthetic to me. Having that's a, not a, a most like a, a futurism. I mean, that's kind of basic uh, human uh, primitive uh, nature. Yeah, exactly. Are those two in conflict, like futurism and primitivism? Do Do you see like a a sort of uh, dialectic between those two? Uh, I think they both need to exist in tandem because they balance each other out in many ways, and certainly 
Marinetti feels that uh, you have to have war and violence and many primitive, uh, simple human characteristics need to be encouraged in order to properly uh, embrace the future, embrace technology, embrace the aspects of, uh, of the future. Were both uh, Lewis and the uh, Italian futurists, were they utopians? Or did they uh, believe more in the, the theory that a history goes in cycles of uh, arises and think, falls? I, I think they were very much realists, and they were looking at time as it was before them. But again, we, we refer back to Marinetti's concept of the cities. The cities are constantly regenerating. Um, everything is regenerating, whereas if we stay in the same rut, they're very much against staying in the same rut, in the same, uh, plowing the same furrow all your life. It's, everything is changing all around, whether it, as I said earlier, whether it goes in cycles, whether it goes in circles, whether it goes up, down, or sideways, things are changing. Um, most people merely adapt themselves to the whirlwind. Some people brace against the whirlwind. The futurist idea is to ride the whirlwind, to live the whirlwind, to um, to board a, a balloon. Is it is it different the from the uh, Evolian concept of like riding the tiger, riding the whirlwind? Is it the same thing? Uh, I don't think so. I think um, Ev Evola is very Evola is very much anti futurist because he's anti he's opposed to all forms of modernism and uh so his idea is just to stay aboard the beast until uh such time comes as you can kill it so um whereas marinetti actually uh is to, you know to marinetti would have the idea of saddling the tiger and riding it indefinitely how important uh do you see as the rule of uh, aesthetics uh, in futurism? Do you see it as an absolute necessary to have a strong sort of aesthetic vision? And that that kind of comes before the whole uh, ideological angle. I think um, aesthetically, um, Vorticism was too strongly aesthetic, and Italian futurism was not nearly aesthetic enough, and that's why it was absorbed by fascism. Uh, but again, the concepts which Marinetti brought forth about automobiles, about different ways of consuming food, about the human body experiencing speed, uh, there's a lot of, and plus the architecture, the paintings, the, the urban design, uh, there's a lot more to it than uh, simply um, considering it from a, a more pedestrian point of view. Well, sure. Uh, Robert and I have been discussing this concept of aristocratic individualism on our show, and uh, you know we've gone over it a couple. You know, we I know we talked about it with you, and we've uh, you know gone over we've gone over lists of who could be considered. An the original uh, context was when uh, Keith Preston, uh, his b book, uh, Thinkers Against Modernity, uh, he mentioned that uh, Alistair Crowley was the best example of our aristocratic Well, sh Well, sure, yeah. And even, well, I even disagree. I think Ernst Younger was the best example of aristocratic individualism. Yeah, well, well okay, so, you know, could, could we, uh, maybe we could end, end, end this on sort of an, on a point that's, Sort of off from what we're talking about. Let's let's go as far as Ernst Jünger goes. How does he fit into aristocratic individualism? Do you consider him a futurist in ways? And uh, could you talk about his concept of like the forest of the mind as well? Well, starting off with Jünger, Jünger has this whole concept of the anarch, which is the aristocratic individualist. That is the fundamental encapsulation of what you're talking about, the anarch. And he writes about the Anarch in Hume's will. And the Anarch is basically riding the tiger, differently than Evola has in mind. But um, the Anarch is basically surviving in any kind of society. Uh, insofar as younger being a futurist, he was kind of a natural futurist. 
um, which is why he partook of LSD with, uh, for the first time with it was a new invention with Dr. Albert Hoffman. It was like, I mean, this was way before any consideration was, you know, of, of this whole idea, of this whole concept of the using LSD. He was there. He was on the front lines of the psychedelic journey. Uh, he was, um, you know, from the, he wrote all these books that are fascinating. I can't think of the name of his book. He wrote about um, Disney World. Um, Younger? And, I'm so, yes, he wrote a book about, um, like, a, a prediction of what Disney World would be like today. And I in can't a, think of the name uh, of the book. In a positive or a negative sense? It was a it was a negative depiction, but it was written from a it was it the the, the it was written in the 1950s, and so he clearly has his thoughts in the future. It's a more realistic science fiction novel than anything uh, Asimov or Heinlein ever wrote. Because oh, wait, it's, what's it's, it called? It's, so I can look it up really quick. I can't think of it. You might look up Ernst Young or D Disney World or something like that. Um, the, um, but, uh, it was written in the 1950s. His publisher actually told him it was too crazy to print because it didn't make any sense and it was no way anything like that. It was too wild to print. And I used to have a copy of it. The Glass Bees. The Glass Bees. That's what it's called. The Glass Bees. It was written in, uh, 1957. Oh, well, yeah, think, the, uh, Dis you mentioned Disney World. Uh, Disneyland opened in uh, 1955, so this was like right after that. Yes, but he envisions uh, the, the Disney World of today or of the 1980s or 70s um, in his uh, depiction of the book. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't consider the Disney World of its day. He, can, he consider, considers a future version of Disney World in which, uh, you know, technology has gone so far forward that it, um, well, there are, uh, there are so many examples of that, like the, like the bees themselves. But uh, in, in any case, that's an example of Younger's uh, views on uh, technology. Uh, then his, there's his work on pain, which is a very interesting es essay on the human spirit, and his understanding of... Uh, uh, military, um, I believe he wrote a book called Total Mobilization, but his belief at the time, prior to World War II, was that wars would be fought by professional armies and there would be no longer... Oh, and of course, we can't forget the um, his, his uh, book, The Worker. Uh, the Worker is probably, you know, um, it's a very futuristic book, which he later disavowed primarily, but, uh, or to some extent in any case, but... Uh, Basically, he, he, he envisions of the future of a citizen of a country who is a technician, a soldier, and a uh, worker, or rather a worker, soldier, technician, all combined in one. And uh, a technician to appreciate the future of technology. So Younger is very much a better example of aristocrat idealist or uh, aristocratic um, individualist who is interested in futurism than Crowley would be, in my opinion. Uh, we are at the end of the show. Uh, Paul, is there anything else you'd like to add about the topics of a futurism? I think, uh, I honestly think uh, the most interesting aspects of futurism are its effects on other things like the culinary, like the literary, more than its most infamous um, influences like on art and poetry. And it's certainly interesting to study all the aspects that it, um, all the aspects that it influenced and had uh, a role in uh, creating. And I would recommend that um, everyone read The Futurist Manifesto by Marinetti. And I think if you are in sync with the modern world, you should not have any problem with the Futurist Manifesto, providing that you're not of the liberal derivation. But in any case, that would be my final two cents, Robert. Uh, Paul Bingham, uh, thanks for being on. Thanks for having me, Robert. Also, uh, thanks, Alex. Uh, thanks for having me on, guys. Paul, it's always nice to talk to you. I hope to talk to you again soon.